or reading all the sons and sons' names. Some of them are not pronounced properly. Can you read one more time? That's <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> kidding. Good morning. Most of us don't like unfamiliar grounds, don't we? When we are stepping into unfamiliar grounds, we feel very nervous. Or some of us are even scared or immobilized by the situation we are facing. I remember when I was in primary school, I stepped into secondary school. The school was bigger, the culture was totally different. I was from a co ed school, I stepped into a boys' school. You know, and it was it was nervous. It was a nervous experience for me. And on the first day I stepped into BMT and uh, I was as a recruit when I entered into the army. A lot of things to remember, a lot of rules to follow. And like for example, you know, a lot of numbers. Well, remember number four, eleven B, twelve O six, S one, S two, S three, S four office, seven BTS. And well, I was from seven BTS at the time. So there are all numbers. So I sometimes I got confused. On the first day when I after army I went to university. After two and a half years of not touching books anymore. I went to took my uh, chemistry degree and chemistry was totally a foreign language to me after two and a half years. I was like, what is this? You know, so it was a nerve uh, wracking experience for me. It, it, it's, it's scary. Oh, the first day I stepped into work as a teacher, but I don't know where the canteen is. You must understand that my school structure that I was teaching in was very different. It's not like a normal school. You walk in, uh, the level, first thing you see is a canteen. You know, my, my school was built on a hill. You know, one side of it, uh, the other side of it is a cemetery. So when you enter by this side of the hill, the staff room is on the first floor. But if you enter by the other side of the hill, the staff room is on the fifth floor. So it depends on which side of you are, uh, you're entering the, into the school. And the canteen is somewhere in the basement. You know, so it's a very confusing, so it, 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 very, uh, very, very fearful experience for some of us. And how do we react? when we are in uh, unfamiliar ground, fear. And why do we feel fearful when we are lost? Why are we scared when we enter into new places or when we have a new experience? Well, I suggest to you that most of the time it's because we are not in control. We cannot be in control of the situation anymore. Right? So that's why we are fearful. I cannot be in control of my life. I cannot be in control of my destiny. I cannot be in control of my experience. And that's what Jacob is experiencing now. And he's entering into a new ground or a new place. And okay, let's take a look at the passage itself. Let's pray, shall we? Father, open our eyes as we open your word. Open also our hearts to know your mind through your spirit, through these written words. Lord, help us. And may, as we study, Lord, may you be with us and open our eyes to see wondrous truth from your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Jacob, from this man you can see, he resides at Hebron and he's going down to Yeshiva. Can you see the, the line there? Tang. Okay, can you see? Can you see the line one more time? Yeah, you see it. <coughs> so he was on the way to Egypt, but he, he, this is a nerve wracking trip that he's taking. It's a scary thing, it's a scary trip because he's stepping into unfamiliar ground, he, because he's going into an unfamiliar place. The custom, the culture are all unfamiliar to him. Plus the law, the law of the land. He's not, he's not aware of what is it like to be in Egypt. And Jacob is feeling very scared. He's like most of us probably when we enter into a new experience, we feel apprehensive or fearful. Some of you may ask, how do you know Jacob is fearful? Well, take a look at the verse. Verse 3, the Lord speak, spoke to him and says, Jacob, do not be afraid. <clears throat> do not be afraid. So because he... Precisely, precisely because Jacob was afraid, he was scared. And there are few possibilities why he was afraid, why he was scared. Okay, and let me suggest to you probably a few reasons why Jacob is, is afraid. This unknown place, as we said earlier, is unknown culture to him. The lord of the land in Egypt is unknown to him. The custom, he doesn't know what to expect out of this whole experience. It's scary. The second reason, C.S. Spurgeon, one of the preachers of the old time, he suggested this, and I think he may be right. Now, although the place is unknown to him, but they, he could have heard something about this place. You know, because that place, Egypt, is a pagan city. It's a city that worships 
hundreds and thousands of created gods or idols. This is a city or this is a society that doesn't know God. So when Jacob is bringing everybody in, he will be thinking, will, these, will, there, will there be a clash of value system? Or will these people influence his family and draw them away from God? It is a scary experience, isn't it? The third reason, because Jacob is old. Oops. Oops. Uh, Jacob is old. By now, he's probably 100 plus. And you know, old people, most old people do not want change. Young people don't mind you entering a new place. It could be a great experience for them. For, but for old people, uh, they don't want change. You don't believe me? You can ask Chinwi. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Chinwi is an old person's trap in the young person's body. So you can ask her actually. Yeah. So, and she has to go there and to settle in uh, Canaan. Lastly, take a look at verse 1. He says that now he's travelling with all that he had. It's a very risky move, isn't it? To move the whole entire family and all his life, his life and possession into the new place. He's like putting all the eggs in one basket. It's very dangerous, isn't it? How many of us would dare to do that? You know, one investor comes and says, we invest, okay, your whole life saving plus your CPF, everything you've done inside. Will you dare to do that? He probably not, right? Because he's very scared. He's like, 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 everything he, everything. It's a very, very risky move. And Jacob was scared, understandably so, because he's nervous about it. It is something like, sometimes we experience this kind of uh, uh, thing as well. We have, have a similar experience entering into unfamiliar ground. Like maybe primary six students, soon you will enter into secondary school. You no, know, in primary five, primary six, you are like the senior of the senior. You know, you are like a big brother and sister. But when you enter into secondary school, what happened? Reality sets in. You are the shortest, probably, youngest, and you re reduce to the junior, no longer senior. And because you are so small, sometimes you are known as a super junior. Okay? It sounds like folk. Okay, anyway, <laughs> you, know, you have a you will be very apprehensive when you enter the school experience like this. Or, when you enter into a new workplace, you don't know your boss, the new boss. You don't know the new SOP in the company, or protocols in, among the colleagues and among the uh, hierarchies in the company. And new colleagues, you don't know whether they are friendly, whether they will backstab you. It's a scary experience. Right? Or, the new ground, the unfamiliar ground, to some of us, it could be injury, or illness that we experience. You know, some of us got injured, or you have some illness we have wheeled into the operating theatre for the first time in our life. Well, wow, that's a very scary experience. Isn't it? But not for Martin, because Martin in and out, in and out a few times, so he's like, okay, just do it. But for most of us, it is a scary experience. Right? Or some illness could be a life-changing experience for us. We could be, after that, wheelchair bound for the rest of our life. You know, it's a new thing. Or death. Death to us is a very unfamiliar ground, it's unknown to us. We don't know what's beyond this. It could be a depressing experience. So unfamiliar ground, yet to some of us could be going into a new church. Right? Like some of us could be new to our church. Is there any new? So, yeah. Last week we have a, quite a number of new people in our church. And they walk into this building, walking into this compound, they like, wow, this land is very big. But the building looks very old. You know, it's a very new, new experience to them. We're, like, we're having a Malaysia feel in Singapore, you know, kind of thing. And when we walk up the worship hall here, they join us in worship, they think, wow, what is this? There's a tall, dark, and handsome preacher. Okay. Uh, no such thing. Okay, okay. So, uh, also, whatever, you know, a new experience can be a, a nerve wracking experience for us. An unfamiliar ground can really be scary for us, right? And Jacob. Entering, going for this journey, he's scared. And he came to this place, you take a look at the map here, he came to this place called Beersheba. Beersheba is a familiar place to him, actually. You take a look at Genesis 23, his grandfather, Abraham, came here and built, uh, planted a tree and he worshipped God there. Then later, his father also came here, Isaac, and Isaac built an altar there to worship God. Now he himself come over to this place and he also worshipped God, right? But, having said that, although it's a familiar place in Beersheba, it is the mark of the end 
of the boundary of Canaan, and it's the beginning of a new place for him. So this is uh, the border of Canaan already, and he's entering into the border of Egypt. It's an unfamiliar place, and at this point, he is definitely scared. But the Lord once again did to Jacob what he did to Isaac his father but at Bathsheba many years ago. The Lord appeared to him in his dream. Verse 2 to verse 4. The Lord appeared to him. And the Lord was very gracious to assure him of his covenant with him, with Jacob. It's the same promise that God gave to Abraham. It's the same promise God gave to his father Isaac. And now God is giving Jacob the same promise again. He says, I'll make you a great nation and I will be with you. And I will bring you up, in verse 4, I'll bring you up back here into the land of Canaan again. And <clears throat> you'll give him back, bring him back to this uh, promised land. Well, if you take a look at this covenant, if you remember this covenant, if you do a quick trace of it, which we're not going to do, but I'm going to show you the references here. This covenant that God has with Abraham, Isaac, and now Jacob is a fourfold blessing. You know, these are the, the passages that you don't have to speak to it, just take, a, uh, take note of it. You trace through this covenant making, there are fourfold blessings, and they are in four P's. First, it's about people. God says, I'll make you a great nation. That means your descendants are going to be very big. Remember, He said that to Abraham, you'll be like stars in the sky and sands on the seashore. He repeated it many times. Okay, and second, God says, I will be with you. There will be a protection. Remember, he said to Abraham too, whoever curse you, I will curse. Whoever bless you, I will bless. There will be a kind of protection. And God says, I'll protect you. I'll protect you. Don't be afraid. Next, there's a possession. It's about the land. God says, I'll give you the land. And now God says, I'll bring you back to this land, to Canaan. You know, there's a land that's given to him. And lastly, there is a program. There is a program about which this program of these blessings doesn't contain within the Israel nation. It is for all nations. Remember, he said to Abraham also, all nations will be blessed through you, and you trace the rest of the covenant, it appears again. All many nations, king will rise and come to you. Again and again, he says that. And now, it is not very uh, clear in verse 2 to verse 4, but at least this program is hinted in the rest, or, or in the next portion here, verse 8 or 2 to 17. This is God's uncommon grace. We're going to do a little bit of jump over here. We're going to jump to 8 to 20, 27 to take a look at God's uncommon grace, the hint of this program. First, take a look at this uh, carefully recorded for us genealogies. It, it's all about Jacob's descendant. We must understand this list of genealogies is not an unimportant random names of random people. And this definitely is not there to make it difficult for Sitong to read so that the rest of us can laugh at him and say, wow, hey, I'm not reading today. You know, so it's, it's not about that. Okay, this whole list of names remind us of two things. Number one, every single individual is important to God. Every single individual is important to God. God knows them by name and God knows us by name. God calls them by name and God will call us by name too. You can now imagine with me that now in heaven, in the scene, there's a book of life. Remember this was in the book of Revelation, there's a book of life and the names of those who are washed by the blood of Christ, the Christians, the believers, their names are written in the book of life. And God will look at these names. They are not random names. They are not, we are not numbers to Him. We have individual names that God look at it and God smiles and God, when God goes through our name, He smiles at us. He says, yeah, this one is here already. This one is coming. He's coming to join me in heaven. You know, you Li Si Pei. Eh, no Li Si Tong. Oh, yeah, the next one, Li Si Tong. Or something like that. So God knows us, each one by name. And each of these names are precious to Him. And you and me, we are precious to Him. We are not here by accident, neither are we a result of some random biochemical reactions. God knows us by name, and you call us by name. Secondly, 
when you look at this theme here, there is already a hint of this program. And I put there, God's plan, God's salvation plan includes people outside Israel. Take a look at verse 10, there was already a hint of this Canaanite woman, his son, a son by this Canaanite woman. Verse 20, Ashenath, who he is herself, Ashenath herself is uh, Joseph's uh, wife. Herself was included here. She's an Egyptian woman. So remember the covenant that God gave to Abraham. He said, all nations will be blessed through you. So, and this is not the first time that the word of this covenant came to Jacob, actually. In fact, this is the third time. The first time it appears in chapter 28. He was on his journey, he was running away from Esau, if you remember. After he has cheated on the birthright, he was so scared he had to run away for his life. Second time in verse 35, he was coming back to meet Esau and was so afraid at verse 30, uh, chapter 35. And now, <coughs> uh, chapter 35, God made a covenant with him and chapter 46 is the one that he was coming back and he was so fearful and God reassured Jacob about this covenant again. And I put there, God is very gracious to reassure fearful Jacob of his covenant. God is very gracious to reassure fearful Jacob of his covenant. Jacob is very uncertain of what he's going to enter into he's, and he's moving towards unfamiliar ground. And God is not like this. God is not like, what's wrong with you? Why are you scared again? Didn't I go through with you in the first, uh, earlier chapters, earlier experience? No, this is not what, what God is like. And God didn't say, why are you scared again? God was so gentle to deal with him, so gracious to deal with him, to assure him again and again of his covenant. And that's how, that's how God many times assured us, isn't it? And the key assurance here, God says, I am God, God of your father. In fact, he's not just God of Isaac, he's also God of Jacob. Uh, God of uh, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. He's the same God through all generations from Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, that keeps his promise. So I put here, <coughs> God will remain faithful to his covenant through all generations. This is a God who will remain faithful throughout history, in all history, and always prove himself to be faithful. Many situations in our life, whether it's engineered by the evil ones, by the devil, or it's because of our human foolishness, we always act as a threat to God's covenant faithfulness, or to act as a threat to destroy God's plan. For example, let me bring this through with you. In Abraham, so what did Abraham do? He raised Sarah. If you remember that it's in chapter twelve. He raised Sarah with the Pharaoh at the time, and then he has a Hagar, Sarah. You know, okay, bring one extra mistress for himself called Hagar, and he really messed up God's plan. That was a threat, but God was faithful. And God brought about Isaac through Sarah. Second, Isaac himself also nearly messed up God's plan. What did he do? He also raised his wife, Rebekah, to Abimelech. Remember? He nearly did it uh, to his wife. And God still remained faithful to protect him, protect uh, Rebekah too. And the third one was Jacob himself cheated on his brother and he endangered his own life by Esau and Esau wanted to kill him. That's not all. And his, his whole entire family was nearly wiped out because of this family. But God preserved Joseph so that this family can be preserved. God's salvation plan is always uh, facing a lot of threats. And now Jacob is going to enter into Egypt. An unfamiliar ground is possibly dangerous to him as well. But throughout all this, God always proved himself to be faithful. God keeps his covenant when there are unknown situations, especially when it's dangerous and risky, God always protects. When it's because of our human folly, God always provides. You know, God has always proven himself to be faithful. And in fact, this is always true throughout history. About AD 02, about that time, there was a king. He's, he's known as Herod the Great. 
he was he conducted a massacre to kill all the boys below two years old around that region that was he was in control. Why? Because the king knew, King Herod knew there will be a there will born a baby who is going to be the king of Israel. In fact, the savior of the world, Jesus, the baby Jesus himself. This happened about two thousand years uh, during the around the first uh, Christmas time. But God was faithful to keep his covenant or to keep his promise. He pro- protected and provided the, the promised Savior, Jesus Christ the King. And this Jesus was through the line of Jacob. <coughs> so the threat continues to threaten God's salvation plan. And but you see, Jesus, the threat was King Herod himself. Our whole salvation plan hangs not in your faithfulness or my faithfulness. Our whole salvation plan hangs on God's faithfulness. Today, Sidong led a lot of songs reminding us about God's faithfulness and His faithfulness will endure forever. Right? His love for us will endure forever. God is faithful to provide this Savior, Jesus Himself, to protect and to protect his, this cause of salvation so that these fourfold blessings can come to us. These fourfold blessings. The people now is not just the Israelite people, the people now includes all generations of people and around the world, the church himself. So the people of God are all those who put their faith in Christ, the church in the whole world. The possessions is it's not just a physical land, that the boundary, the physical boundary there. Now the possession that we have is a spiritual boundary, the kingdom of God. And we now possess that as well. We belong to the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God belongs to us. There's a protection too. Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Just like what God told Jacob, isn't it? And I will be with you. And now Jesus says, I'll, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And now he's with us forever in the person of the Holy Spirit living in us as believers. And lastly, the program is ongoing. It's ongoing. Is the way we are saying the gospel, living the gospel, we making disciples through this gospel that we believe in. The program is ongoing is to include more people into God's kingdom to save more souls. And among us, if any of us were not a Christian, you can be part of this fourfold blessing too. God's promise and blessing can come to you. How? When you come to this faithful and gracious God and you confess your unfaithfulness to Him or real rejection of Him. And you believe that only through His Son, this Saviour and King that God has graciously protected and provided 2,000 years ago, who died on the cross and rose again to forgive our sins and to rule in our life. When you do that, these fourfold blessings is yours. You belong to Him and you acquire His kingdom. You have His protection in the person of the Holy Spirit now, forever. And you can be in this part of this gracious work of including this, uh, disciple making. We have a faithful God through all generations. How should we respond? And how did Jacob respond? Verse 5 to 7, an unusual response. Jacob responded to God's promise. He showed that he trusted God and he moved confidently ahead. He did not always respond this way. If you if you're noticing Jacob's life, at least not in the past. You know, he had this similar experience of fear. Remember in chapter 28, he was running away from Esau. He was fearful. Second, when he was coming back to Canaan, he was about to meet Esau in chapter 32. He was very, very scared. What did he do? If you remember in chapter 32, he divided his possessions into two camps, remember? Then he sent waves and waves of gifts to Esau. After that, he gathered them back and he moved forward until he wrestled with God or angel of God at night. That's what he did. He always trusted in himself, his own planning. But now, he's going to Egypt with everything that he has. Can you see in the verse? In verse 6, he says, with all his possessions. Verse 7, with all his descendants. Everything. Now we begin to see that Jacob responded differently. Jacob has changed. He began to trust God and move confidently. Verse 1 tells you that when Jacob came to Beersheba, what did he do? He prayed. 
he first learned to pray. And then he no longer divide his possessions again. And I put there, he depended not on his own wisdom anymore. Like what he used to be. He, he always depended on his Xiao Ming, his own wisdom, you know, how to do things. But now, he learned to depend on God and do it God's way. What does it mean for us as believers? You see, in our life, there will always be unfamiliar grounds that we will be walking into. A new school, a new workplace, maybe a family that you have, that you're setting up with, church, new experience, maybe illness, or death that is going to face us, of our church presently in TCEPC, maybe you're going to start a Chinese fellowship thing. What should we do? I suggest three things that we must bear in mind, we must do. Number one, remember, always bear in mind and speak to yourself this gospel truth. We have a faithful God through all generations. We have a faithful God through all generations. He's faithful to bring about His promised Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ. Through all history, He just keeps His promise. Will He allow any random accident happen to you that is out of His control? In the first place, there is no random accident or danger which is out of His control. Things could be out of my control or out of your control but it will never be out of His control. And there are times that in facing unfamiliar grounds, we are exposed, we are vulnerable, we are at our weakest. And this point here, it doesn't mean, it, it's not necessary. it's the worst moment of our life. Sometimes unfamiliar ground, uncertain situations may be the best situation in our life. We are not in control in this situation. And that's the reason for our fear. Remember in our introduction we say fear because we are not in control. But secondly, I want to recommend that besides remembering that we have a faithful God, recognize that being not in control may be a good thing for us. That we will learn like Jacob to depend on God and not on our own wisdom. And understanding that God is molding us and shaping us like He did to Jacob. He has provided protected the best for us in giving us His Son, the Saviour, to die on the cross for us. Will He not bring you through the unknown as well? And when, we are, when it's out of our control, the third thing we can do is to be like Jacob. Verse 1, he prayed. He offered sacrifices and I'm sure at the po- a point he was praying. I do not know what he prayed about. There are some commentators who suggested the things that he prayed. We are not sure because these are all, all, but, all, all, all speculation. But however, I like to suggest that we can pray these things. Number one, we confess. Number two, we ask. Number three, we thank God. We confess to God that we always want to be in control of our life. Isn't it? We always want to be in control. We don't want things that are out of our hand. We don't want to be in the unknown because we feel very uncomfortable when we are not in control. We confess that to God. says, God, I'm sorry that I always want to be in control of my children. I want to be in control of my school. I want to be in control of my career. And confess that to God. Second, ask God to help us remember that we have a faithful God in Him. Let the Gospel remind us again and again. If God preserved His salvation plan throughout history until He brings about it to come to pass in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ, Will He not remain faithful to us? Will He allow any random accident happen to us? So ask Him to help us remember that we have a faithful God in Him. Third, thank Him. Thank Him that through this unfamiliar ground that we are entering into, thank Him that He is teaching us that He is in control and we need not to be in control. Thank Him that He is moving us, shaping us. One example, quick one, is in the responsive reading that we read in Acts chapter uh, 18. Like in Paul, he was entering into an unfamiliar ground in the Corinth city. Paul was afraid. That's why when God appeared in the vision to him, he says, Do not be afraid anymore. Go, for I have many people in this city. God assured Paul. And what did Paul do? Paul trusted God. He went and preached and ministered boldly. 
And because of that, through Paul, God rescued many more people into the kingdom of God. So sometimes, unfamiliar ground could be, it could be the way that God is bringing salvation to many people who are still in the bondage of sin to dust. Maybe it's unfamiliar for us to reach out and talk to a neighbour that we have never even smiled before. Maybe it's unfamiliar for us to sit beside a classmate and say hi to him or her. It could be any of these. You know, but this unfamiliar ground could be the way God is using you and me to reach out to another person, to save another person. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. And we are always not faithful to you. But you have always proven yourself to be faithful to us. We thank you above all in your faithfulness, in your grace, and your mercy. You brought about salvation in our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we can trust you for every detail of our life. Thank you for all these faithfulness that you showed to us. Keep us faithful by your grace, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Pray all these in Jesus' name.